Good evening and welcome to the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy here in Singapore. My name is James Crabtree. I'm an associate professor in practice at the school. And you've joined us here this evening for the latest in our Asia Think Thinkers series of public events looking at the state of the COVID-19 pandemic and what follows. Our discussion this evening is on the rebirth of big government, state capacity, trust and privacy in the post-COVID era. Um, and it's my great pleasure to have three fantastic panelists on three different continents, in fact, um, to join us this evening. So uh, beginning with uh, those of you in Singapore, Singapore will be um, very well aware of Senior Minister Tarman Shanmugaram, uh, who is the, you can see him here on the screen, uh, Senior Minister in the Singaporean Government and Coordinating Minister for Social Policy, and also uh, one of Asia's leading public intellectuals, and particularly on the topic this evening that we're discussing. Uh, joining then from London is John Micklethwaite. John uh, is the editor-in-chief of Bloomberg, the former editor of The Economist, and the author of two books which are relevant for this topic, one from a few years ago called The Fourth Revolution, The Battle to Reinvent the State, and one which is forthcoming called The Wake Up Call, based on an article, on an essay rather, that, that he co-wrote for Bloomberg about a month ago. Uh, talking about the fact that COVID had revealed a number of weaknesses uh, in the state, particularly in West. And so he's going to give us a precy of the wake up call this evening, which comes out, well, you can tell us when it comes out, John, in a, in a month or two, very quick turnaround. And then finally joining us um, admirably early in the morning, just after 8 a.m. Uh, is Rana Faruhar. Rana is a columnist for the Financial Times and an author, again, of a couple of books which are relevant for this discussion, uh, one of which uh, was uh, came out recently, um, Don't Be Evil, um, but her preceding book, Makers and Takers, about the, the relationship between the state and capital um, in the United States, um, also relevant for this discussion. So that's our panel. The way we're going to do this is each of our speakers um, are going to speak for six or seven minutes and lay out their stall for you on the subject of, are we having a return to a new era of big government? What have we learned about the powers of the state um, in the aftermath of the COVID moment, a moment in which the state has been never, almost never more than in wartime, more essential, but also in many ways, and particularly in the West, revealed to be lacking in various ways. And so they will give us their sense. Then, as I say, we'll have some discussion amongst ourselves, and then we'll turn over to audience questions. And we're going to go through uh, until 9.15 p.m. Singapore time. So we're going to go for an hour and 15 minutes. Please do leave your questions. You can leave them in the Q&A function on Facebook. Um, uh, um, uh, and we will get to as many of those uh, as we can. Please leave your name if you want your name to be, uh, to be referenced. Um, the only final thing I should say is this event this evening is supported by the Singapore Global Network, which is a division of Singapore's Economic and Development Board. And so we're very grateful to them. Um, and so uh, there we are. So with that, let's get started. So the discussion this evening, uh, a return to a new era of big government. Let me hand over the reins to Senior Minister Tarman to give us his opening thoughts on this. So Tarman, over to you. Thanks very much, uh, James. And it's um, uh, wonderful to be together with um, Rana and John. Uh, both um, uh, very thoughtful um, uh, commentators. Um, uh, let me just um, say that uh, we have to think about the post-COVID world not so differently from the way we thought about um, the way the world was trending before COVID. What COVID does is to intensify the challenges we already had. In some ways, it fast forwards the slow moving challenges that were already there. Um, and it makes, um, it makes the challenges far more complex uh, because we're having to deal with a crisis, an unprecedented crisis, which is unlikely to be of short duration. Uh, at the same time that we address the underlying challenges um, virtually across the world in both the most advanced countries and, and um, much of the emerging world. And when you think about these challenges, they're clearly not challenges that are going to be uh, solved by, by markets alone. Uh, but there's also very little confidence that governments around the world are going to be able to address these challenges very well 
if they stick to old ways. Uh, what are the challenges? First, we have a very real prospect um, of entering a world of secular stagnation, um, very slow growth, hardly any productivity growth and wages being uh, stagnant, particularly for the large middle majority. We have a challenge of um, providing a fair deal for people uh, in most societies. Uh, there's a loss of confidence that um, either governments or markets can provide a fair deal. Um, so working a little better in some societies, you know, Sweden, Singapore, a few others have managed to sustain significant wage improvements um, for the median worker. Um, but um, in, in general, uh, a fair deal has been elusive. Uh, we have a challenge, particularly in the advanced world, and, and in some emerging countries like Brazil, Thailand, a few emerging countries of aging societies. Uh, and in general, the world is unprepared for aging societies, unprepared with regard to sustainable healthcare financing schemes, sustainable pension schemes. And finally, the existential challenge of climate change uh, and the broader uh, shift in the world's um, uh, natural systems uh, that will uh, complicate all the other human challenges we have. Uh, none of these can be solved by the markets. The markets haven't done a very good job um, at even what you would have expected uh, to be the basic task of markets, which is to provide for growth, provide for some upliftment in wages uh, through productivity improvements. Markets haven't been very good at it. But the governments are going to have to change their ways as well. Um, and it doesn't mean just more spending and getting larger, uh, first because it's not going to be feasible uh, to pile up more and more debts, but second, it's, um, uh, history has shown that that's not the most effective way in which we can tackle these challenges. So fundamentally, we need a new compact between state and markets, state and community that makes the most of the energies of the markets, of entrepreneurship, of innovation, but uses markets not just to achieve private gain, uh, but to achieve public purpose. The challenge of using markets, private finance, private entrepreneurship, private innovation to develop public goods and to serve the public purpose is I think a fundamental fiscal policy challenge and a fundamental uh, approach or orientation uh, that we have to take when we think about the role of government. And the challenge of tapping on communities, empowering communities, empowering educational institutions, employers, the social networks that allow towns to regenerate themselves in larger societies. Um, that's a fundamental challenge. So we have to think about this reordering of a relationship rather than about the state getting larger and larger in order to tackle these fundamental challenges that we face. I think I'll stop there um, and we'll, we'll take it up later. Very good. Okay. Thank you very much for that. So that was uh, an admirably brisk introduction. So much, much appreciated for that. So John, over to you. You think we need a, a new Leviathan. So tell us, uh, tell us about that. Well, thank you. Um, I think my conclusion is we probably will end up with bigger government. I'm not entirely sure that is the right answer at the moment. I think the way to look at COVID is as a, a test for government. Um, it was a test of functioning government. And if you look at the numbers, some people performed well and others didn't. And I think the difference between different versions of government and how they did was fairly extraordinary. Um, so just to use the sort of basic level of deaths per million, which I accept is a kind of crude analogy. But at those levels, you have the UK with around 700 deaths per million. You have the US with 430. Um, you have places like France and Italy in the high 500s. But then you come to countries which perform better with COVID, um, like Germany, that's around 100 per million. And then you go all the way to Asia. And in Asia, you get numbers of six, seven, that's South Korea, Japan, Singapore, I think is slightly higher. China claims a figure of three per million. And I think what's interesting about this is that even if we think that the Chinese are not being entirely honest about their numbers, even if we think um, that they played a role in not restraining the virus when it began and various other things, 
even if the numbers are not entirely accurate, by any measure, the, the many countries in Asia were doing a much better job of protecting their citizens than the Western democracies. And I think that will pose questions about what exactly government did. And I think the conclusion of that will be that people will think that they want more government. And I just want to go through sort of different versions of that. I think the most extreme version is that some people will think that the answer is that they want more autocracies rather than democracy. And for obvious reasons, I think that's 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 not just wrong per se. I think it's, it's a sort of category mistake. It will largely be based on the idea that if you take China, and as you say, as I said, you compare its record against America, by most measures, it's been much more successful at protecting its citizens in that sort of basic sense of whether you can protect people against a pandemic um, that America has been. But once you begin to compare China with good democracies, I mean, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, but also Germany, New Zealand, Australia, there, there are plenty of democracies which have done very well. So to, there are plenty of autocracies that have not done that well. Um, Russia's had a tough time. I don't think anyone particularly wants to um, uh, go to Belarus where the leader rather famously even out Trump, Trump by um, uh, suggesting that people should drink vodka and drive a tractor in order to um, survive COVID. So even if you look at the failures of the West, which have been quite high, the failures of democracies in some places, I think by any measure that there is no real evidence that autocracies are better at this. And besides, if there was ever going to be a, an issue where you would expect autocracies to be quite good, it would be dealing with things like pandemics where you need to be able to order your citizens through various things. And then you have all the other disadvantages of autocracies during normal times. So I think the more likely thing is that within democracies, people will, I think, quite want to have bigger government. Why, why do I think that and why do I think that's wrong? I think it's likely because firstly, you know, that is what has happened during the pandemic. We've had to call on government to help us. Um, it does go right the way back to Thomas Hobbes and Leviathan. The whole point of having government was to protect us um, initially from each other, but also from things like diseases and, and, and such things. Um, you go back right the way back. That, that is the ultimate reason, the ultimate raison d'etre of the state to protect you. You give your powers to Leviathan in order to protect you. But, and it's well worth stressing this, especially in the autocratic terms, you know, it is a temporary thing. Hobbes was alive during the Great Plague. During the Great Plague of London, everyone was given, if you had a sickness in your family, you were given a white stick to carry around. Well, once the plague went, you no longer had to go out with a, with a white stick. And so what we have to hope, and I, I think probably will happen, is that most of the powers that we have given to government in the sense of restrictions of liberty will probably rescind as things like vaccines and things come through. But there will certainly be a push towards bigger government there. The second push, I think, will just be the force of history, as Rana, amongst others, has you know, pushed. Gov government was increasing anyway. You had 9-11, which persuaded people to build bigger security states. You had the financial crisis, which I think persuaded people that people wanted more um, intervention. You had nearly $13 trillion pumped into the economy in the wake of the financial crisis by central banks. So there was a trend in that way anyway. I think politically, you're going to have people on the left who will like the idea of bigger government per se. It's interesting the way that both Jeremy Corbyn and Bernie Sanders have left the stage, both proclaiming victory um, for their ideas, if not necessarily for their um, campaigns. And I think people will look at opportunities to go, to go bigger. And in this, I think actually what's interesting is that you can see in America, particularly in the wake of George Floyd, I think the combination of George Floyd plus COVID, I think has pushed, even in quite conservative circles, the idea that America does need to level up. Again, this is stuff which Ron has written about previously. But you know, there, there is more of a more of a, a significance in people beginning to think about different ways in which the state should support people. I think you also have the right especially Donald Trump and uh, Boris Johnson, you have some idea of self-sufficiency. So you're not getting much pushback from the right and you're getting the left pushing it. So, so politically, I think you've got to push towards a bigger state. And the last reason is normally the thing that should restrain us is the markets. But at this particular moment, I think we do live in an age of what 
Sebastian Malaby called magical money, um, where at the moment everybody can borrow. So there isn't the normal sort of restrictions. So that all those things imply to me that we're likely to end up with bigger government. But all the same, I would argue that shouldn't happen. And I think there are two reasons why. One is that eventually, I think the age of magical money runs out. Um, there's a good line in Hemingway where somebody asks somebody, how did he go bankrupt? And he says, gradually first and then suddenly. Well, that, that tends to be the way that bankruptcies happen, even with countries. When you look at some of the democracies of the West, sheer levels of debt, um, there is some point at which the markets say stop, or Mrs. Merkel says stop, or something says stop. And I think that will eventually come in. The bigger reason, which I'll come to last, is I think government doesn't need to be bigger. As Tarman said, you look at, you look at the problems of Western government, they, a lot of those come from overloading the state rather than necessarily um, there not being enough of it. And I think what needs to happen in the West is there has to be a reform whereby the state is targeted much more towards those who need it and targeted much more to the basic ideas of providing security, ensuring liberty and doing all the big things. And yes, in some countries like America, that could mean that you end up with a bigger health system. In Britain, it might mean you end up with a health system that, that, that uses private resources more. You can look at many things across the world, but in general, you end up with a simpler state, one which, um, as Singapore has shown amongst other places, you don't, you don't need to have a big state to be effective. To embarrass them, when you look at things like schools and hospitals, Singapore, as we all know, does amazingly well on that without spending a lot of money. So the success in this field is not purely to do with cash. But there are certain areas where I think this particular disease has underlined the way in which um, the state needs to be changed and needs to be reformed. So from all those perspectives, yes, I do, I do think it is a wake up call about the state. I fear that it will drift towards an argument about just bigger government. But I think it's actually a chance to reinvent government, which I think matters enormously to the Western democracies. So that will be my pitch. But hopefully it's also set up rather. Good. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, John. That, that's terrific. Um, so let me just hand over to Rana and give you the, for our third uh, closing introduction. So we'll move move from the the London or the British countryside to to New York. So Rana, give us give us your sense of the the role of big government or the return of big government. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, James, and thanks, John, for teeing me up so well. I appreciate that. Very honored to be here with such great speakers. Um, so I do see this in historical terms. I do think that government is going to get bigger. Um, I have a lot of overlap in my thinking with some of the things that John just sketched, but I actually think it's a welcome moment for government to take a bigger role. Um, I would go back and just look at the last hundred years and notice that there are cycles of wealth accumulation and wealth distribution. I mean, these cycles have been around really since the beginning of time. But there's kind of a direct analogy to be made. If you go back actually to uh, 1918, Spanish flu, um, you had a major global downturn. You then had central bankers coming in and just as they have recently in the last decade or so, putting a lot of money into the economy, a um, lot of deregulation brewing up of both a consumer and a corporate debt bubble, which eventually ended in 1929 in a market crash, which by the way, and this is interesting to note, given where we are today, it wasn't immediate. There, it, you know, the, the cycle kind of went like this. So um, we had about three years between uh, 1929 and 1933 or so when the market ultimately bottomed out. And then of course you had bigger government, you know, you had the new deal, you had several decades from roughly from the 1930s to the 1970s where you had re-regulation, which was necessary uh, at that point, you had redistribution, which I think was also necessary because in the lead up to the mar market crash in 1929, you had um, wildly skewed levels of wealth inequality. You had um, corporations taking on a lot of debt. You had consumers taking on a lot of debt. So again, very similar to where we've been, I think in the last few decades, but particularly um, in the lead up to the great financial crisis. Um, so in the 1970s, by that time, the pendulum, which keeps swinging back and forth between the public sector and the private sector, 
had probably gone too far, right? So you had big sclerotic government, you had probably too much union power, and that's why you had the Reagan-Thatcher revolution, and you had neoliberalism, and you had the Chicago School, and the markets knows best um, sort of thinking that was particularly pronounced in the Anglo-American world, but a lot of the developed world, uh, and ultimately a lot of the developing world. Um, and that was appropriate at that time. You know, you needed to have that unleashing of animal spirits, tax cuts, the ability of companies to grow, uh, the ability of globalization to spread, um, you know, but again, these pendulum swings, it, it seems sort of that, that you can never quite land just in the middle, that you've got to swing to extremes. And I would argue that uh, in the run up to 2008, you had between 2003, 2007, you had the highest levels of overall global growth ever before in history, but you also had an, an increasingly fragile financial system. We, again, we had that crash in 2008 and just, just as in the period between 1918 and 1929, you had not a real Main Street fix, but a Wall Street fix. You had the Fed, and ultimately central bankers coming in and dumping something like $70 trillion over the last decade into the global economy, that hasn't really solved the underlying problems of growth on Main Street, you know, for, for real economies. You have a, an incredible disconnect right now, a disconnect that I thought was going to end a few years ago, but, you know, seems to be able to last longer than that between Wall Street and Main Street, between markets and the real economy. But I think what COVID has done is it's really pulled back a scrim on that fragility. And I think we really are at a tipping point where the fortunes of Wall Street and Main Street are going to reconnect. I think you're gonna see further market correction. I think that that is going to ultimately be something um, to go to John's point about magic money that central bankers will not be able to control. Um, and I think that you will then have to have government coming in uh, and really re-regulating, creating what I hope will be a productive bubble um, around something like green technology. And when I say productive bubble, I'm referring to the fact that often when you need to have an underlying productivity um, boom in an economy, you, know, you need to create that new, new thing, be it the railroads, be it the internet, that's often something that government pushes forward. If you look at those, those two things, um, uh, it, it, it tends to be the government literally laying the foundations for a new area of growth that the private sector can then go into, commercialize. And you know, this, this, there's, there's winners, there's losers, but it's the public sector that's laying the groundwork. And I'm actually hopeful. Um, not to, I don't want to jinx, jinx anything in advance of November, but I'm, you know, we're, we're seeing the polls in America looking like it might be quite a large Biden victory, might even be a Democratic sweep. Um, if that happens, I think that you are going to see, again, the pendulum shift. We've come too far towards the market knows best um, approach. You're going to have to see some re-regulation some higher taxes for corporations, some distribution of wealth to kind of even things out. Um, I hear Joe Biden talking about a Green New Deal. I'm very optimistic about that. I think that that could be a great way to seed the ground for a new productivity boom, but also put a lot of people to work. I think that's exactly what government should be doing. Now, there's a risk, and this goes to one of the points um, in the title of our session today, which is trust. And this is where there's some overlap, I'll just say finally, between John's point of view and my point of view. I think that in particular, if you see um, uh, a liberal government in the US, there's gonna be a big debate about whether or not to fund government spending with magic money, with you know, basically more of the same, simply using uh, the, the, the Fed, quantitative easing, maybe even kind of looping treasury officially into that easy money paradigm to fund programs that would be ostensibly for Main Street rather than Wall Street. So kind of a QE for the people, um, as, as folks are calling it. I think that would be a big mistake because I think ultimately that will erode trust. I think that the US and the Anglo-American world in particular, but many developed countries are frankly in for a period of pain. I mean, we have had four or five decades of wealth creation, easy money, 
credit booms, uh, consumer debt papering over underlying problems, it's not going to be solved overnight. And so I think I'm hoping that we are going to see, um, frankly, higher taxes <laughs> on corporations and the wealthy. We're going to see the elimination of loopholes like carried interest. Um, we're going to see a sort of a cleaning up uh, of some of the problems that have led to the populist politics that we have now and created this lack of trust in government. And I think that that is going to be the big question. Can government regain trust? Will, that, will the leaders make the right policy decisions in order to do that? So I'll stop right there. There we go. I'm unmuted. Thank you very much. Um, terrific. Thank you to all three of you. That was great. Um, so there we are. You can now see all four of us uh, on the screen. Um, so in a sense, Tarman, if I was to be crude about this, we have Rana saying, yes, new period of big government, and probably this is a good thing. And John saying, yes, new period of big government, probably this is a bad thing. Do you want to reflect on this in a minute? Do you, do you sit elegantly between the two? And, and in a sense, how, how, would you, uh, how would you reflect on what they said? Well, I think, you know, one part of what John was saying was that um, uh, it can't last anyway. Um, uh, it is, uh, uh, there are some prominent uh, economists uh, who now talk about um, it being possible to sustain growth and uh, equitable societies at very high levels of debt. Uh, but I would say there's, um, uh, there's a, a very strong weight of informed opinion uh, that would uh, urge uh, caution against thinking that you can simply borrow more and more and it's all for free. At some point, uh, there's a constraint and there's a burden that debt exerts on growth. Um, if you think about what happened um, after the war, the Second World War, Actually, levels of debt were far higher than in the US and the UK and in many parts of Europe, much higher than what we see to, today as well as what's being projected today. Um, and there was a dramatic reduction in the, in the level of debt in the United States, in the UK, and in several European countries over a period of 40 years. But it only happened because of very rapid growth. In fact, it was nominal growth. It was inflation as well as real growth, sustained real growth of about 3% per, per year over 40 years, but significant levels of inflation. And that solution isn't available anymore. First, because real growth isn't there. Uh, there's a serious issue of stagnation of productivity growth, and the, the dynamism of most market economies has been lost. It needs to be regained, of course. But second, people aren't going to tolerate inflation the way they used to. First, societies are much older now, and older societies with pensions that are often not indexed to inflation. Uh, second, I think central banks have done a fairly good job of, uh, to use a technical jargon, of anchoring inflationary expectations at very low levels, 1.5 or 2%. And I just don't see it realistic at all, socially or politically, for people whose wages are stagnating, retirees whose pensions are uh, are nominal, they're not indexed, they're not real pensions, to accept high rates of inflation. So that old solution uh, that uh, uh, was the de facto solution for reducing debts uh, after the war remarkably over 40 years just isn't available anymore. And we now have to confront the fact that many government bonds, government securities, which used to be called safe assets, U.S. Treasuries might still be a safe asset, but many government bonds today are in the minds of investors, including long-term investors, uh, not quite the safe assets they used to be. Uh, they're now credit instruments in the normal sense. And uh, if you pile up more and more debt, it means that you're going to have to refinance debt every year. You've got to roll over debt. And a large part of it is, is in fact, relatively short-term debt. And what we have to think about is what happens when confidence is lost. It could be lost for a whole range of reasons. It may be political, it may be a financial mishap, or it could be just the fact that debts are getting higher and higher and the, the investors get nervous. Once confidence, that confidence um, uh, is pricked, you get very large movements in interest rates. 
uh, for the debt you're trying to roll over. And that's when you get a, a cycle of instability. It happened in Greece. It happens regularly in the emerging world. But I fear it's going to happen in more parts of the advanced world, parts of the world which were thought to be relatively stable. So there is a constraint. So I just wanted to point that out, that um, the point that John made, first about magical money, but also about the unsustainability of debts, is a very important one. The laws of gravity will continue to operate. Let me, let me ask the three of you uh, um, uh, the same question. Let's just begin our discussion by talking about COVID and the pandemic before we head off into the into the stratosphere, as it were. I mean, so Tarman, you just mentioned wartime. It's often, a wartime analogy is often made. It, it, COVID reminds me of the moments of the Napoleonic Wars or the Second World War when elites look at their governments and realize that they are lacking in, in particular ways. You know, they, they can't do these things that we thought they could do. Our people are not properly educated. They're not healthy enough, whatever it might be. What have we learned about the nature of the state from the pandemic? What, what would you take out of, in a sense, how well it's performed? And let, let me ask Tarman first, because I suspect the Singaporean performance might be slightly more positive from what we've learned from the UK and, and the US, but I may be wrong about that. So Tarman, what, what have you taken out of the last six months about the, the kind of the nature of the state in Singapore? Well, I think if you, uh, first I agree with what John said. Um, if you look at the countries that have kept fatalities uh, very low, you have Singapore, New Zealand, Korea, Taiwan, um, uh, Japan. Um, it's not so much the uh, nature of political systems in the sense of where they are in the span from you know, liberal democracies to autocracies, as much as competence and trust in the state and trust amongst all the parties uh, involved. A trust, which is hard to measure, is intangible, uh, turns out to be a, a critical determinant of how well we can manage a crisis like a pandemic, critical. Um, if you think of what it has required, um, especially since we don't yet have a vaccine and we, we are not sure when we will get a vaccine, it requires ways of cooperating with each other such that if someone gets infected, we are able to trace very quickly who else has been interacting with that person. So whole set of tracing um, uh, arrangements using technology, but a lot of it is just manual and it's really a social network at the end of the day. Second, the willingness to uh, be tested frequently, which is going to be an ongoing feature in, with this uh, pandemic for many months to come, possibly even years. Uh, these are essentially arrangements that uh, uh, require a high degree of trust and a willingness to cooperate and a willingness to do something personally that is socially responsible. And it does require a state because markets on their own, social markets on their own don't produce that, um, uh, that um, uh, willingness to cooperate. Uh, but if you think of these societies that have done it well, it's basically been that willingness to, to cooperate and play a responsible part yourself or your family in order that everyone benefits. Second, I would say that as, as John was hinting, um, uh, the quality of healthcare infrastructure is critical, primary as well as um, secondary or, or, or uh, hospital infrastructure. Um, there's no doubt about it. Um, uh, and if you look at, uh, across the world, even within the advanced world, uh, unfortunately, one of the discriminators in the COVID crisis has been the quality of healthcare. Uh, the faster you can identify someone who's infected, the faster you can treat that person and isolate the person uh, and give the person high quality healthcare, the lower your fatality rates are going to be. Uh, and that too is one of the um, uh, reasons why Singapore, like some other countries, has, has gotten by with very low fatalities. It does rest, however, to go back to the theme of our, our, our webinar, it does rest on a public sector role in healthcare. Singapore has a public sector dominated healthcare system. Uh, and even the private GPs, as it were, um, are, are now coordinated as part of a public healthcare system. So uh, I've no doubt in my mind that just like in education, healthcare is a public good 
and the public sector has to be an anchor provider, a large anchor provider within the healthcare system. That's how you raise quality, that's how you spread quality, but most importantly, that's how you keep things equitable so that rich, middle income and poor are all able to get a very decent level of care. Rana, same same question to you. I mean, I presume in, in the US, it's been a rather more um, sort of humbling experience in some ways, but, but in a sense, what have, what have you taken out of the last six months as, in terms of the, the capabilities of the US state in, in the way it's handled this? Well, you know, at the moment, there's the question of the US state, and then there's the question of the Trump administration, right? And um, there's some overlap. Um, I'm, I'm hopeful that this administration handle growth handling of the crisis it's not singular but you know i would actually look more broadly at say the us versus germany and that's a comparison that you could have made pre covid um, where you have in in germany which has done i think the best of the developed countries in terms of handling the crisis you have more of a balance of power between the state the private sector and labor and we just don't have that in the us you know, I, I had a very interesting conversation um, right when the pandemic started and we had shortages of masks in the US. I had um, uh, a couple of CEOs from apparel companies ringing me up and saying, you know, nobody's buying t-shirts now. We have all this spare capacity in our factories. We really want to make masks, but we need some help. We need someone to help coordinate. Uh, at the federal level. And for all the bluster of this administration about making things in America, absolutely no ability to coordinate, absolutely no understanding of um, industry, of local ecosystems. It's the opposite in Germany, you know? And, and that turns out to be a pretty good economic strategy, not just for getting through crises, but for capitalizing post crises. You look at how Germany, uh, in the wake of the great financial crisis, for, for example, you know, you had the kind of um, uh, furlough scheme where companies, uh, the private sector, the public sector and labor would share pain, help to keep um, workers on staff, retrain them. And then when markets resurged, for example, when China came roaring back right after um, uh, 2009, you had German companies ready to go in and take market share away from U.S. competitors who, you know, their strategy is lay everyone off en masse and then you have to rebuild from scratch once the recovery comes. I don't think that that kind of efficiency strategy is sustainable anymore. I think you're going to see this move away from efficiency to resiliency, and that's going to require more cooperation between the public sector and the private sector. John, do you want to do you want to leap leap in here? And and uh, I mean, is is it right to say that that in some sense, I mean, you made this point in the Bloomberg essay that that you wrote that in in a way this has this moment has revealed some deficiencies, particularly in the the once dominant Western model of the state. I mean, is that a fair conclusion to reach? Or? Yeah, I think it, I think it, I think it is a this you know we call our book the wake up call because that's what it is. I think it's a kind of you you have these opportunities. If you look at the great sweep of history, you have these opportunities where um, crises reveal just how good your institutions are, just how good your leadership is, and many of the things which both Tarman and Rana have said. And it's it's partly it's horrible when these things happen, but what really matters in every kind of great empire from Athens to Rome to whatever, to China actually. Um, what matters is how you react to them. I think in general, COVID has, you know, it has shown, again, Ronald pointed this out, le leadership does matter. Um, you know, I think there's no doubt that the populace, especially Trump and Johnson, did not pass COVID just in pure terms of, you know, reacting to a crisis, working at how to use experts, um, you know, right the way down to, advising people to inject themselves with detergent. You know, there's, there's been a, a whole variety of failings at that level. Um, and if you compare that with somebody like Angela Merkel, you have someone who takes government very seriously, very methodically, even dare I say it in a sort of Singaporean way. And, and it, does make a, it does make a big difference. However, I think notwithstanding everything that Donald Trump has done wrong to do with COVID, I think it's just clear as day that the American healthcare system the American welfare system was extremely badly prepared for this. It doesn't really matter who was running um, the White House. 
the, the structure of American government is not set up, the healthcare system is not set up for things which both Rana and Thurman have pointed out to deal with these, the, these ideas. And the, the notion, from, from my perspective, the idea of reforming the American health system and coming up with something that does provide health care for people is part of, uh, of the need to provide security to, to everybody. And if on the one hand you have that from an American end, and I, I don't think when you say these things in America, sometimes people talk about socialism, but the, the basic fact is America spends more on its public health care, let alone anything to do with private health care. Um, than places like Sweden, and it has terrible infant mortality. It has worse health numbers than anybody else. So from my point of view, it shouldn't really be to do with the ideology. It should just simply do with pragmatic. You know, what governments are lousy at is they're lousy, unlike the corporate sector, looking around the world and seeing what works and borrowing it. And by any measure, the, you know, the American healthcare system was not, would, not, would have done a pretty bad job with COVID because it is designed, a lot of it, for old, rich people. Um, and, and, and dealing with their problems rather than a, a widespread public health system. I think at the other end of the scale, you've got the British system. There you have the other fault a little bit. The NHS, rather stupidly, didn't draw on private testing facilities and things like that in the way that other public systems like Germany, Singapore did as well, um, and other people did. And, and, and what all these really show me is that you, know, you, you need to rethink, in a sense, how you're delivering those things. So competence matters enormously. I think trust, another word which both Rana and Tarman have used, if you have no trust in your government, you're unlikely to do what people tell you to do. And I think another big area which came through is just people. Um, one of the advantages of the Singaporean system is that they, I'm not going to embarrass Tarman, but they, 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 you, you pay politicians and civil servants well, you reward good ones, you get rid of, of bad people. And that is not true of the Western public sector. So to the, all those senses, kind of COVID was like something that I think pulled off the lid and said, you know, presented a case to the voters of the West saying that you have to perhaps rethink the structure, which re you really haven't reformed um, much, at least since the 1930s and probably further back than that. D Tom, let me, uh, so in a sense, I think we have a kind of consensus amongst the panel that some well-organized Western countries and some rich Asian democracies have been better than others. But I think we also have a consensus that there are various pressures that are going to push to increase the size of the state over the coming period. And we have a division over whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I wanted to ask within the Asian context for a country like Singapore, but also uh, this would also be true of countries like Malaysia, Korea that have quite small state traditions how difficult do you think this change is going to be to manage? In a sense, are we now leaving behind the era that somebody like Lee Kuan Yew would have argued that, that you need to have a small state and low taxes and, and all that came with it? And what does that mean for, for countries in, in Asia as opposed to the West? Well, first, um, I've no doubt that the uh, size of the state, the size of government budgets um, will grow as societies get older. And that's for obvious reasons. Um, but the basic uh, uh, demand is going to be for effective states, uh, states that are able to achieve outcomes efficiently and in an inclusive fashion. Um, and I think that there are two points I'd make there. It requires a certain activism on the part of government. Um, so, if, you're, if, you're, if I take what Rana was talking about earlier in terms of that um, pendulum or the swing in, in belief systems and in, in uh, uh, practices, I think we're not going back to large states per se, but we do have to go back to a system of having faith in activism on the part of government, on having uh, a sense of moral purpose in government, of having the confidence to convince a population uh, that these are the right things to do and we're going to all have to organize ourselves together to achieve it. And an ability to focus the resources of the state on what matters most rather than everything. So you don't necessarily have to be very large, but you have to be very good at the most important things you should be doing and go about it 
with a with the spirit of an activist i would say that one of the uh, very important um, uh, priorities going forward both in the advanced world as well as the emerging world and and remember the challenges in the emerging world are going to be on a much larger and far more complex uh, nature compared to the advanced world a fundamental priority has to be to recenter government and fiscal policy on the provision of public goods we were just talking about healthcare but if you look at the state of education in the emerging world if you look at the state of education in the country that rana is sitting in um you know that is one of the most fundamental failings of the societies and governments that have not been able to achieve inclusive growth it is highly unequal education systems where standards in every dimension the quality of school infrastructure uh, the quality of teachers uh, every dimension you look at standards are highly unequal and that's something which you know 40 or 50 years ago was regarded as a fairly obvious thing to do it no longer is in fact even sweden started privatizing its school system and they found that it um, hasn't worked out very well it's led to greater inequality and they're, they're trying to to check that but the idea of focusing government first and foremost on providing public goods well and equitably education increasingly skills accumulation through life being able to match unemployed workers to new jobs which the market doesn't do very well but the state has to get involved in as a curator and as a coordinator the idea of providing in the emerging world livable cities livable cities which most of the emerging world doesn't have you need an activist state to want to coordinate resources to bring private players together but to design housing neighborhoods urban transport with a public purpose in mind so and of course r&d r&d and innovation that is a public good and that's how the us achieved its um, its uh, greatness over a period of uh, three or four decades with darpa being a very important part of it it requires the state so if you focus on public goods and you try and do it well and you try and leverage and to leverage on the energies of the private sector and on communities you have an effective state uh if you try to do too many things and there are some much more broad ranging concepts of industrial policy much more broad ranging concepts of how you go about trying to uplift society um it's good in in concept and in in thought but it is not worked out well anywhere in the world so do the things that the state is meant to do as well as possible it doesn't require a huge amount of resources i mean healthcare which john was talking about singapore spends in fact half the amount or or you know our percentage of gdp spent on healthcare both public spending as well as national spending is about half the level of most european countries and about much less than one third of what the us spends but our outcomes are no inferior in fact in general superior so it doesn't require size as much as how you go about organizing yourself and how you ensure that everyone plays a responsible role and everyone feels they're contributing as well um i think that's you know, it's not just a lesson from singapore i mean singapore is a small country but there are lessons even from some of the scandinavian economies of that collective responsibility um and people knowing that they're not just doing their part because the state is telling them to do so but they feel they are contributing to society they feel that it's a society which is inclusive in the sense that i'm contributing and everyone is contributing i think that's a culture that's that's a true prog- that's a truly progressive culture rather than those that rest very largely on redistribution in the passive sense it's got to be a far more active progressivism um let me i'm just going to i'm going to turn to the audience in just a second and then uh, just before that we have a, a little innovation which is my team is going to show us a word cloud of the questions that have been asked but rana just um so you can you can see who's been asked here um so we have government leadership the state the big state uh community um but rana I, one of the words i see in there is inequality which tarman mentioned so just before i rattle through some of our questions from the audience you mentioned in your introduction about um uh 
about one of the demands that the state is going to be called upon to fix is going to be various kinds of inequality. I think particularly one of the, the thoughts you have is between the old and the young. And I wondered if you could touch on, on that, just put that on the table before we, uh, before we go over to the audience questions. Uh, yeah, for sure. Well, you know, just before I get to old v. young, um, inequality in the U.S. has been growing for decades. Um, overall, average wages flat for most people since the early 1990s, um, for the working class since the 70s. Um, so this has been a problem that's been brewing for some time. Um, I think, again, COVID has just sort of pulled back the scrim on that problem and particularly on the wealth divide between the baby boomers and the millennials. And even pre-COVID, you had um, millennials coming into, the, into a, a dampened workforce, which had been dampened for them in particular since the great financial crisis, um, you know, trying to get jobs in a handful of superstar cities, which is where most of the growth are in places where rents were too high, um, but that's where the jobs were. So they were being squeezed from all, all sides. They also had to deal with this record student debt bubble, um, which we could do a whole nother hour on. <laughs> um, you know, more debt, student debt out there now than, than credit card debt. And in fact, that had led Bill Dudley, former um, New York Fed uh, chief, to, to say that this is the biggest headwind to US growth in the mid to long term. This idea that millennials are so burdened by debt that they're not going to be able to spend. They're not going to be able to buy houses. They're not going to be able to save. Um, and so you've got this imbalanced system where, you know, frankly, people like me, I'm a 50 year old uh, mother of two with a home in Brooklyn and a good retirement savings account. And I've enjoyed many of the benefits of a 40 year bull market. Um, 20 somethings don't have that. And so that is going to lead, I think, to what will probably be the biggest political square off, in, certainly in the US, maybe in many other parts of the world, between the old and the young over this shrinking public pie. You know, I mean, public, as we've already gone into, the public sector is, is beleaguered, uh, it's becoming more so. You're going to have this sort of push are we going to enhance health care? Are we going to? save retirement benefits or are we going to have a student debt jubilee and i think that that is something that's going to define politics going forward and the the big question is where is the growth going to come from unless you start growing the pie i think we're in for a period a long period of more contentious politics along age lines very good Let's, uh, let, let's turn over to the audience. So I'm going to, many of you have, I've got um, dozens of questions here. We're not going to have time to get through, but I'm going to go through as many as I can and invite my uh, panelists to be reasonably brisk in their answers. So uh, I'm going to start with Sean Lee and ask Tarman and then John this question. Uh, so Sean says, big governments tend to be associated with big spending. So how does this um, square with Singapore's approach to lean government? So this is the question I was asking you before that you elegantly uh, uh, half answered time man, which is, is this a big challenge to Singapore's tr tradition um, and expansion of the, the role of the state? And then John, I know this is something that in a sense is part of your worry. So maybe not with Singapore, but you, you can answer this um, more broadly. So is the, is the area of, of lean government now past us, time man? So um, I addressed that in, in part uh, earlier on, uh, but another dimension uh, of the answer to that question is that we have to think not so much about uh, size of government per se as much as fairness. Who's paying the costs? Who's getting the benefits? How do things stack up for the poor and the middle income group? Um, think about the shape of the curve uh, rather than uh, how large government is. And I think a uh, uh, Going forward, as much as in the past, but especially going forward, uh, governments are going to have to get more progressive. In other words, more of the contributions will have to come from those who are better off and wealthier. Um, and we're going to have to provide greater support for those who, who are poor and those in the middle income group. Everyone should contribute something more as societies get older. But fairness dictates that things have to stack up in favor of the poor and the middle income group. I think we should think in those terms. In other words, how progressive are we? How fair are we? How much social justice is, in, is implied in the system? Rather than just about 
size of government. And that indeed is our approach in Singapore. We don't have a large government, but it's a highly progressive government in healthcare and education, in our whole system of social security. And I think it'll get a little more that way um, in, in the years to come. So that's another point I'd like to make that um, the focus really isn't simply on how much you're spending and how much total revenues you're, you're getting, but who's paying how much and who's benefiting how much. And the concepts of progressivity are what we have to focus on. John, do you want to say a little bit more about, in, in a sense, the, the small state tradition and, and whether this is, in a sense, um, not behind us, but certainly uh, on the retreat? I think the small state tradition was actually, in, in the 20th century, was a very small one. I don't think, I mean, if you look at the numbers on Reagan and Thatcher, they didn't do very much. Um, I think, oddly, if you want inspiration, you have to go back to the previous century where you've got liberal governments, especially in Britain, who came in and reduced government in the same way as Singapore has, but focused it on, on helping the poor. And I think if you look at, Tarman was talking about public goods. Yes, you, you, know, you do need a public healthcare system. You need a public education system that deals with people at not just at the high school level as we do at the moment, but at you know, both later in the sense that there are a lot of people 50 something who probably need retraining, but also much earlier in terms of kindergarten and things like that, which is where inequality set in. We did states that spend money on infrastructure. And obviously we need some degree of preparedness for things like COVID, but also for global warming and, and stuff like that. And a lot of it you can just do by modernization. It's crazy that Rana's sitting in Brooklyn and her children, I'm guessing this, are going to schools whose timetable is set on the basis that they need to go back and collect the harvest. Um, you know, the basic formats of, of, of so many of Western public things are set by things a hundred years ago. We no longer live in an agricultural society. But in exchange for doing that, yes, you, I think there is a lot of room to cut. I think you have to look at issues like entitlements. I agree. I think it's wrong, basically, that people like Rod and Thurman and, and, and I should receive free bus passes. I don't think Warren Buffett should necessarily get a pension. I think there's a whole variety of different things where you need to target things towards the, 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 the genuinely needy. And the same token, you need to really take a hand to exemptions and this cloud of obfuscation, which has crept around, especially the Western state. And the idea of the interest groups of simply, the interest groups win in government, by not by massive things usually, but by tiny little exemptions here or there. In the American tax code, you've got $1.6 trillion of exemptions. You can pay for a hell of a lot of public goods by getting rid of that. And you start focusing in that particular area. That, that, so that would be my answer. And I think Asian countries, picking up on your thing, are going to look at this and decide what to do. Um, very good. Ra Rana, let me ask you a question from uh, Jill To. Um, she says, what are some of your thoughts on what she calls the technological solutionism that has emerged in the um, aftermath of the crisis? So Tarman and John both mentioned, I think John in his introduction mentioned the, the fact that in a sense, powers of the state that begin in wartime often don't end after the war is finished. And, and so what, what do you think of the expansion of the technological reach of the state, given this is your specialist subject of big tech? Are, are we in danger of, of kind of unleashing powers that we might want to regret? Or is this part of a generally positive move? Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, that's a complicated question. I, I'll start by saying that um, even before COVID, about 80% of corporate wealth was in 10% of companies. And those were the companies that have the most personal data, software, IP. So we were well in en route to this kind of shift from the tangible to the intangible economy, from the real to the digital. And COVID has, of course, just sped all that up. I mean, it's, it's fascinating that I'm sure... Um, none of us have really seen all that much disruption to our work lives. Um, we're still doing what we do. We just do it on Zoom. We do it from our homes. It's fascinating to me that um, right after uh, the, the pandemic really hit in the U.S. and you had a huge spike in unemployment, you also had higher real wages because all the jobs that were not virtual went away. And so all that was left with were sort of virtual knowledge workers. Um, 
the, you're, I think you're going to see more corporate concentration in the financial sector, the pharma sector, and in particular the high tech sector. I think that does come with certain risks. Already, even before COVID, you were seeing this sort of push in the US for national champions in tech to rival what it perceived to be um, national tech champions in China. I mean, this, this idea of the US-China tech war, trade war, cold war, I think has been really put on steroids by COVID, but it was coming anyway. That's worrisome to me um, for many reasons. One, because I'm very disturbed by surveillance capitalism. I'm, I have a much more sort of European view towards privacy. Um, I think that there needs to be much more public oversight, much more transparency in terms of how data is collected, what kind of data is collected. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I think we are gonna see things get worse before they get better. On the other hand, I'd go back and look at, at historical parallels. I mean. What's happening with the internet today is exactly what happened with the railroads over 100 years ago. You saw huge concentration of power, huge monopolies developing. To touch on a point that John made, huge political interest then buying out, uh, a huge corporate interest buying out politicians um, uh, in, in the federal government and state governments. And eventually that reached an extreme. And then you saw a movement towards trust busting. You saw um, Louis Brandeis come in and, and really shake things up with monopolies. I think we're headed towards that again. I mean, it's interesting on Monday, you're going to see the four CEOs of the top tech firms in the U.S. Um, testify around antitrust issues. So I would not be surprised if you saw greater regulation of the tech sector in the next five to 10 years. Very good. Um, Tarman, back, back to you. I, I've got a couple of questions here on your your new compact, people wanting you to explain a little bit about what you meant, just flesh it out a little bit. So um, I had a, a question um, about who defines what the, the public purpose is and how can the community play a bigger role? One from Alicia Lim about how the new compact should be negotiated. One from Genevieve Ding uh, about the need for collective responsibility and what is the role of an activist civil society. I, I wonder if you might just put a little bit more flesh on the bones of, of what you mean by this. This is the new compact sounds good, but uh, in a sense, is it something that anyone could disagree with? What, what, what's the, the harder edge to, to this idea that you're promoting? Well, I think um, if you look at what's uh, happened in recent decades, um, and if you look at the difference in, way, in the way in which um, conservatives or those who are uh, on the right of the political spectrum have um, interpreted what's happening. Um, there's a tendency to think that um, people who don't do so well, um, whose families aren't doing well, whose wages are stagnant, um, aren't exercising enough responsibility for themselves. Um, and for those who are on the left-hand side of the spectrum, um, progressives and, uh, uh, you know, in the US you call it liberal, um, uh, there's a tendency to think that, well, the problem is that um, uh, the state isn't doing enough to support them. Um, and I think both those ways of looking at society are getting very tired um, and have also lost their appeal. Um, certainly, um, uh, we haven't seen a sudden surge of irresponsibility on the part of people that can explain why wages have been stagnant for three decades. Um, I mean, social norms have evolved, but it's not as if uh, you've had an explosion of irresponsibility to explain a very stark outcome, lack of real wage growth for a large part of the population in the US and many societies. But at the same time, the old system of redistribution um, hasn't worked out well. It doesn't give people a sense of true inclusiveness. And I think the problem is that redistribution was too much about compensating the losers and not enough about helping people to regrow and helping to regenerate communities, towns, and individuals, and empowering people to come together, to work with companies, work with an educational institution, empowering networks of people. So the, the compact that we have to strengthen and keep 
keep uh, reinvigorating has to be a compact which involves collective responsibility. It does involve the state, it does involve the community, but it's a compact of people themselves playing an active role to improve themselves, uh, to take responsibility for their families. And I think it's that thinking about how it's not one or the other, it's about taking collective responsibility and self or personal responsibility at the same time that creates not just a better sort of uh, uh, economic outcome, but it just creates a better culture. It creates a better sense of society on the part of everyone uh, and the, the feeling that you're empowered. So I think it's doable and there are examples of how it's done in some societies. Uh, even in the United States, you find it in local areas working out better than in other places. So it's that not thinking it's an either or of either the state or, or, or populations collectively having to take responsibility for others, but it's about self-reinforcing responsibility. And if individuals take responsibility for themselves, if families take responsibility for, the for themselves, we're much more likely also to sustain that culture of collective responsibility and vice versa. Very good. Now, I, I've got a bunch of questions at this being Singapore, this is our favorite topic about the future of globalization. In a sense, the conversation that we've had this evening has been quite national, um, which makes sense when you're talking about nation states mostly. But, but John, maybe I could ask you this. So the, the, I had Wong Rong Jun asking, what impact would bigger government have on the wider forces of globalization? Sobi Swilem, what is the future of globalization and multilateralism? I mean, you, you as editor of The Economist and now chief of Bloomberg, you head two very pro-globalization institutions, but does, in a sense, the forces that you've outlined necessarily come along with the, the, the move towards deglobalization and a more, more return to a more national type of capitalism? I think, I think at the moment, it's, it, we, we've, the, the tide was already quite tough for globalization pre-COVID. You know, you had, um, we talked a bit about Anglo-America, but you suddenly had the, the British and Americans who had wandered around the world preaching, as you pointed out, the benefits of globalization. At the very least, um, Donald Trump is someone, it's, it's not just that he hasn't preached it, he's pretty much been preaching directly the opposite, um, in a culture of America first, anti-free trade packs. And I, from a, from a, should it happen, I think there is an... Uh, now, we may have just lost John in the English countryside, but, but, and this I think is a really important thing, you know, in terms of that, that's what I hope for in terms of the analysis, um, you know, COVID has only increased, I think, the, the fact that people are turning towards arguments to do with national self-sufficiency. We've had talk of national champions in Europe before COVID, now it's increasing. Um, you're going to get much more, not just from the left, you're getting it quite strongly from the right of people around Trump saying, we don't want to rely on the Chinese for this X or Y or Z. We have to be self-sufficient in this. Boris Johnson's also been talking about this. So I think in general, um, if even in the places where globalization was generally welcomed, it's having a tough time. I don't think COVID, you know, COVID is not going to help any of this. And the fundamental, you know, the fundamental tools of globalization, travel, the free movement of people, by definition, this has been much more difficult. So from an anal analytical point of view, I think sadly it's, it's not heading in the right direction. Rana, did you want to come in on, on that point? Uh, I mean, I suppose one yeah. of the areas, you write a lot about industrial policy and the kind of rise of new industrial policies as, a, as one aspect of this. Yeah, no, I, I, I would agree. I think that we're, um, again, pendulum shifts. I think we're in a kind of a period of um, deglobalization might be too strong because it depends on what kind of globalization you're talking about. Certainly free, free movement of people and goods uh, has been um, thwarted uh, capital somewhat. Uh, digital information flows less so, although I think we are moving to kind of a tripolar world in yeah. terms of digital trade where China, parts of Asia and the developing world, um, Europe uh, and the US are going in different directions. Um, I think we probably will see that tripolar world around trade and tech. You might, in fact, I was arguing in my Monday column, um, 
I'm, I'm hoping for some kind of transatlantic alliance around um, rules of the road for, for digital trade and taxation. I think um, the US and Europe shouldn't go it alone. That's gonna depend a lot on, on leadership. Um, but I think certainly tripolar world and not a return to globalization a la the early 1990s. Um, Tarman, I had a couple of questions um, about jobs from, from Singaporean members of the, the audience. So people worried about what in this part of the world we call retrenchment. I mean, one of the, the classic arguments for greater state action from the 1990s was active labor market policies. This is a big um, issue for government in the aftermath of COVID. Can you say a little bit about what your expectations are? You know, what, what reasonably in the face of the crunching recessions that almost every country are gonna to have to go through, what reasonably can the government be expected to do? Well, I think if you look around the world today, um, one of the reasons why some countries in the advanced world have much higher uh, levels of unemployment than others, say if you compare the United States with Germany, for instance, uh, has been that, that big difference that in Germany, you've got an active labor market policy. Um, in much of Northern Europe, you have it. In places like Singapore, you have it. Um, and that's very different from simply giving people unemployment benefits when they are unemployed and then leaving it to the market to somehow get them back in. Um, one of the things that... Um, uh, you know, you don't need to be an economist to agree with this. Um, once you're unemployed, particularly for some period of time, uh, your skills tend to fade and employers tend to disfavor you when you try to come back into the market. So the longer you're unemployed, the more difficult it is to get back on track uh, of getting a decent job, but also being on track for wage mobility over time. So it's extremely important to get people into jobs soon ideally in a field that they're familiar with, where they've accumulated some human capital in. It may not be exactly the same industry, but it may be an adjacent industry. And it requires a very intensive effort to upskill and reskill people. They've got, everyone's skills are always relevant for the future. Whatever job you're doing, it stays with you and it's going to be relevant in your next job. But you'll very often need to supplement what you had with new skills. And what COVID is doing is it's really uh, making this a far more urgent task. We've got to move much faster to reskill people and make them suitable for the next job that's available. Um, we're having to do it in a context where demand is weak globally and in all our countries, which complicates the matter. We're not in full employment where you, know, you train someone, the person will have a very high chance of getting a new job. So what we're doing in Singapore Given the COVID situation, given the weakness in, in, uh, in, in demand for, for permanent jobs, is we are devising schemes where we will, the public sector will subsidize attachments and traineeships in firms so that people are in real firms doing real work, even if they're not on a permanent job yet. And the public sector has to play the role of subsidizing those positions. Ideally, uh, this should lead on to a permanent job. And we are also going to strengthen our incentives so that hiring for permanent jobs uh, is, is also attractive for firms. But we have to be realistic with a degree of uncertainty that we now face over COVID, including the possibility of um, uh, new waves. Um, even growing companies and you know, companies which um, uh, are entirely viable uh, economically uh, are cautious in hiring. So there is a role for the state. There's a role for the state to subsidize wages and to subsidize traineeships. And that too is what we were talking about earlier. It's about state capacity, it's about coordination, and it's about trust between players. Now, I want to ask, we're just about up out of time. I want to ask all three of you to give us an optimistic thought to end on, but just because you're speaking about that time, and there was one more question about exactly that topic. Um, so uh, Wong Rong Jun asked, uh, is it time for Singapore to look at instituting unemployment insurance, as uh, given you're talking about labor markets, and then we'll have our optimistic point to end. So do you want to take that one, Tarman, just at the end? Well, I think whether it's unemployment insurance, which means that you pay premiums well in advance, and then if you're unlucky to be unemployed, you're able to take something out, or it's an unemployment benefit scheme financed out of taxes, 
all these are schemes that we'll have to consider if we face a situation like many other advanced countries face, which is high structural unemployment. Uh, every society with high structural unemployment and a large number of people who are unemployed for long periods will require some form of unemployment benefit scheme. Um, we don't need it in Singapore yet because our unemployment rates are very low and we've been able to get people back into jobs uh, relatively quickly. So in a, in a way, it's, uh, it, it's the, the priority is to do what we're doing as well as possible. And we're doing it in the most difficult circumstance, which is COVID, where growth is sharply negative. But look at Singapore's unemployment today. It's still far lower than it is elsewhere. Even if you compare Singapore with Hong Kong, we have much lower rates of unemployment. If you compare it with Germany even, despite the Kurzarbeit uh, scheme in Germany, uh, much lower in Singapore. It's because we are coordinating more quickly and we're getting people back into jobs more quickly. But it's going to get more difficult in the next six to 12 months. We've no doubt about it. And that's why we're working intensively on this whole set of arrangements to reskill people, put them back into firms on traineeships or attachments, even if they don't yet have a permanent job, and try to make that a pathway to a new permanent job. If you do that active labor market policy well, uh, we won't need to invent an unemployment insurance scheme. If we fail and over time we find we have high structural unemployment, we'll need some form of unemployment benefit scheme. Very good. Okay, now, so we've run up against time. So let, let's just have a kind of final thought from each of you, starting with... Uh, with John and then Rana and then Tarman. So give us something to be optimistic about. This has been, I wouldn't say a gloomy conversation, but a challenging one. This is a very difficult time. Uh, and even the prospect of more big government comes with a lot of costs. So in a sense, looking forward, what, what, are, you, what are you optimistic about? Or what, what do you see as something that's unquestionably positive coming out of this period? John, uh, uh, over to you. I think the optimistic thing is, is weirdly to do with history. You look at history and you, you can see there have been these huge revolutions in, in government throughout history. And they tend to happen when several things come together. When you have new technology, we have, as we've heard, huge amounts of that, as, as Rana was just saying. When you have new ideas, we have plenty of governments around the world who are doing clever things, such as Tarman's put forward to do, you know, doing education cheaper than other people, but still getting better results. But in the end, you need sort of political will. And the interesting thing about the political will is it's very often sometimes motivated by genuinely high minded ideas like looking after people and so on. But it's also often motivated purely by competition. And I think this time around, if you are the American people and you have watched doctors in Manhattan, you know, one of the richest countries of the world, having to wear ski goggles because they didn't have enough equipment and nurses wearing garbage bags because they didn't have enough equipment. I think that will pose questions to people about what sort of state they want. And I think this time there will be a reaction. Well, that's at least what I hope. Very good. Rana, give us something to be uh, cheerful about as we end our conversation this evening or this morning with you. <laughs> um, well, we've talked a lot about the failures of large states, the US in particular. But there's a lot happening in government at the local level that's actually really heartening. Um, you know, I look around and there's a huge variance in how different cities and states have handled the crisis and many of them have done very well. Um, and I think that you're gonna see, as we sort of reset to a post neoliberal era, to an era in which um, communities are going to want more control. I, I think that you're going to see some of those experiments bubbling up. And maybe if the federal government to, um, you know, focus on something that uh, Tharman, a point that he made, uh, if, if they can play a coordinating role, kind of collating those best practices and spreading it, you know, more widely, I think that I think that, that can happen. And I think that would be a great thing. Very good. Tarman, final thought from you. Give us, uh, give us something to feel cheerful about. Well, I think one of the um, uh, positives coming out of COVID and coming out of a deep crisis that, um, that uh, we're all going through is the um, recognition um, of the role that ordinary essential workers play. Uh, they're largely blue collar workers. Some of them are, are you know, doctors and other professionals, but the role of ordinary people 
uh, is now much more widely recognized. Um, and those who are doing the, some of the toughest jobs are now getting a lot more respect um, and um, a sense that, you know, there's a sense in society that we have a lot of silent heroes amongst us. And they're not always the people with the best qualifications or these sort of top jobs. They're ordinary people who are helping to keep our society together in crisis. And more broadly, I think the crisis is leading to a refocusing on the fundamentals. Um, if we can strengthen our social compacts, whichever society we are in, we have a better future. And sometimes you need a crisis to refocus on that fundamental. Social compacts make for a better future for everyone. Very good. That's a nice point on which to end. So thank you very much to all of you for watching. We had, a, I think, the largest audience for any of the event in this series, more than a, a thousand people watching during the event this evening. So thank you to all of you, especially to those of you who asked questions. My apologies for not being able to get through all of the dozens that were asked, but we try to get through as many as we can. Thank you in particular to John in the United Kingdom, to Rana uh, in the morning in New York, and to Taman here in Singapore. Um, and please do come and watch future events in this series at the Lee Kuan Yew School. And thank you very much for watching. Um, good evening. Good evening.